before we can actually talk about forces in a meaningful way, we have to do some name calling. Not my favorite part, but it has to be done. So I've, I've made a little table for you, a chart, and we're going to talk about the different forces that we will be using uh, in this class. Folks, during the next little bit, you're going to get the uh, impression that Greg is just really, really picky. That he likes things done his way. And that he's just kind of a little bit uh, controlling. I assure you, none of that is true. Ask my family. I'm an easygoing guy. However, it turns out that whenever you are solving a dynamics problem, a force problem, the first step to every such problem is to draw what's called a, a free body diagram. So if I were drawing a free body diagram of, say, the Greg, I would draw all the forces acting on the Greg onto that diagram. I represent the Greg as a dot, big dot. And I add all the forces. Now here's the thing. If you start a problem with the wrong free body diagram, you have exactly, exactly 0% chance of getting the rest of the problem right. That means on the next exam, if you start a problem with the wrong free body diagram, you're wasting your time and your ink. Okay? So that free body diagram has to be right. Now, what I'm going to show you here is a recipe that will guarantee that every single free body diagram that you draw is 100% correct. If you follow this recipe, you'll never, ever get it wrong. Okay? I promise you. And that's why I am so insistent that we, we be picky. It's because I love you. I want you to do good. I really do. Okay? Now, we take all the forces, all the macro, macroscopic forces in nature, and we divide them up into two classes, contact and non-contact. Now, let me see if I can illustrate the difference. If I go outside with a picnic lunch and I sit my butt right down on the grass, right on the earth, we know that the earth is pulling on me with a gravitational force. My butt is touching the earth. I'm in contact with the earth. Is this gravitational force a contact force or a non-contact force? Non. non, non. non. Because we also know that we can take Greg to the top of the physics building, throw him off, and the earth is still going to suck him down. Okay? Yeah. You don't need that contact between the planet and the earth to have that force. It acts either way. Now, that's the way we're going to divide up these forces. If contact is required... Your name again, sir? Barrett. Barrett. Uh, you know, if I wanted to hit Barrett, i got to get right up here and just pow! I can't go back here. You feel that? Feel that now? There has to be contact in order for that force to be effective. Okay? But the gravitational force acts through space. Okay? And so that's our first non-contact force, the gravitational force. Now we're going to find that everything with mass, like this book, attracts everything else with mass, like this glass. But we're also going to find that that attraction is so minuscule, so tiny, that we can neglect it. Unless one of the objects is huge, like the Earth. So we're only going to worry about gravitational forces exerted by the Earth on things. And we call those weight forces. So the first force I put on any free body diagram is the gravitational force, the weight force. It points towards the center of the Earth. I would label it with a W for weight, and every force is an interaction between two things, things you can taste, smell, touch. There's a, a doer and a doe. Something is exerting the force, and something is experiencing the force. This force would be by the Earth on the grid. Or I would sometimes just write it, Earth, comma, grid. Now, again, it seems picky, right? If you label them this way, 
you will never get the wrong force on a free body diagram. And finding the third law of forces that we'll talk about on Friday will be a cinch. This is always going to be by, comma, on. The earth is pulling on the ground. Now, the electromagnetic forces break up cleanly into electric forces and magnetic forces. Now, in 207 today, we started our discussion of the, of the electric force. It's a very rich subject. It's uh, one of the better parts of 207. We're not going to talk about electric forces in this class at all. However, each and every one of you, I bet, has a refrigerator magnet holding things to your refrigerator. And you know that refrigerator magnets and refrigerators attract each other. We're going to deal with the magnetic force at that level. And we're going to call it a capital M. So, like the refrigerator on the magnet, or the magnet on the refrigerator. Now, there's also a class of forces called nuclear, or nuclear, depending on who your president is. And uh, we're never going to talk about those again. Those are the strong forces, the weak forces. They hold the nucleus together inside an atom. They, uh, the weak force uh, is involved in beta decay, uh, different decay mechanisms. We're never going to talk about those. Now, here's the beauty of this. Every time you draw a free body diagram, you're going to be worried about well, did I get the right forces? Well, the first force you put on your diagram is the wave force, always. Then you ask yourself, self, are there any magnets in this problem? Usually not, sometimes. But once you've dealt with those two non-contact forces, all other forces have to be contact forces due to things that touch the grid. And so all you have to do is ask yourself, what's touching the grid? And for each thing that touches the grid, you ask, does it push or does it pull? Now let's talk about poles. Chains pull, ropes pull, threads pull, strings pull. We call those forces the tension force, and we use a capital T to denote them. Now in two weeks' time, we're going to have a tutorial on tension. I call it the mother of all tutorials. It is just a thing of beauty. I've seen people weep over the beauty of that tutorial. I've seen a lot of people weep over it. Okay? Now, suffice it to say that if it's not a rope, it's not a chain, it's not a string, it's not a thread, it's not pulling. Okay? So let's talk about pushes. And in order to talk about pushes, I need everyone to, to do something with me. I need you to clear out a space in front of you. Every single one of you, right now. Otherwise, you're not going to learn. I need you to push down on the table at some arbitrary angle. It's like 53 degrees, okay? Something arbitrary like that. Now, I want you to memorize right now what you're feeling. And you should be feeling two different sensations. You should be feeling a pressure in your palm. And you should be feeling the skin pulled back on your bones. Do you feel that right now? I didn't say you could stop. Keep going. Okay? <laughs> now, now you can stop. Lift that up. But now I want you to just lay your hand down. And with your other hand, push straight down perpendicular to the table. Until you feel that same pressure you felt before. Now, folks, don't stop. While you're pushing down like that, there's something missing. That creepy feeling of the skin pulled back on your bones. So what I want you to do is, while you're pushing down, push your hand forward, edge it forward, until you get that skin creeping back on your bone feeling. Got it? Okay, now, you can stop. What we just did is take an arbitrary push and break it up into two pushes that are very different mechanisms. The first part is this part that was perpendicular to the table. Okay? Now that's what gave me the same pressure that I was feeling with the general push. Now what would I call a force that is perpendicular to the surface, that always points 90 degrees to the surface you're pushing on? 
What would I call such a perpendicular force? Pressure. Pressure is actually force divided by area, but we're going to find that that's, that's equal to this force divided by the area. What would you call a perpendicular force? I'd call it a perpendicular force. <laughs> but they didn't ask me. I wasn't alive at the time. And it turns out that it was named by mathematicians. And they named it the normal force. Because over in the math building, they don't quite understand what normal is. I've been to their parties. They're not normal. <laughs> okay. They think normal means perpendicular. And when they say, hey, you know, that, that looks normal, they're not saying it doesn't look abnormal. They say, they're saying that looks perpendicular. So any force that is normal or perpendicular to the surface, we call a normal force. That's 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 a normal force. Now, folks, the normal force is the most common type of force. Whenever one thing pushes on another, there will always be a normal force. There may also be this other force that causes the skin to pull back on the bones. Where the nooks and crannies of my hand are being grabbed by the nooks and crannies of the table. What would you like to call that force? Friction. And friction is one of the messiest forces that we have to deal with. We're going to spend a lot of time next week talking about friction. We'll find there's two different flavors of it. Uh, I call them the easy and hard kind, but everyone else calls them the kinetic and static kind. But for now, let's just recognize that it's the nooks and crannies of my hand grabbing the nooks and crannies of the table and vice versa. Now that general push was part perpendicular and part friction. Now if you ever wonder whether there's a friction, friction component to a push, imagine greasing down the surface and asking yourself, could I push just the same as I did before? If you're pushing purely perpendicular and that table's greased down, no difference. But if you're trying to push with a friction force and it's greased, you can't do it. So that's how you can tell. If I look at this free body diagram of the Greg, the Earth is pulling down on the Greg. Are there any magnets? No, not yet. Be patient. What touches the Greg? The floor. Does it push or does it pull? It's not a chain, it's not a rope, it's not a thread, it's not a string. Must push. Whenever one thing pushes on another, there will always, always, always be a normal force. There may also be a friction force. Now if I'm just standing here, do I need a friction force? I mean, if we grease down this floor, could I just stand here? Yes. Sure. But if I tried to walk, I'd fall on my face. So if I need a friction force to walk, but to stand here, all I need is a normal force. See if your neighbor is on the bus with this name-calling thing. Now, for historical reasons, the friction force is given the symbol small f. And these are the five types of forces that we will be using on all of our problems. Every single force that we put on a free body diagram will either be one of these two non-contact forces, or it will be one of these three contact forces. You'll never put a force on a free body diagram that's just capital F. There's a force. No, it's got to be a certain flavor. And for each force, you'll put what is it by, what is it acting on. And if you do that, I promise you this next section of the class will be so easy. So easy.